Thank you very much. Had some uh, good news from Mrs. Combe. We had a young person in the school. She got to lead to the Lord today. So we praise the Lord for that all the time. Um, getting to see kids saved and things like that is just really, really great. So as I said, pastor's not here tonight. Um, you get the backups. This is a backup, backup type of service today. <laughs> Um, but I think it'll be good. Um, the lesson, it's something that I think uh, the Lord's been putting on my heart a little bit, and he kind of confirmed it with some things that happened in the past couple of days that I thought was just really interesting. Um, and you'll understand kind of what I'm talking about here in a second. But it's going to be more of a teaching time tonight, and I just hope that you'll listen attentively, and um, even if you think that this doesn't apply to you very much. So the title of my sermon tonight is Compromised conversation, okay? And we're going to be in 2 Peter chapter number 2. So if you can turn there tonight, 2 Peter chapter number 2. Verse number 6. The Bible says, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just lot, vexed with filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them, and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I just pray tonight that you would bless this message and that um, you would help um, your word just to go forth and that um, the principles that we're going to be talking about tonight would be applied in our, in our own lives, Lord, in a practical way and that you would help us to um, deny a conversation that's corrupted by the world, Lord, and that we would be examples for you and that we would be witnesses for you in everything we do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So here, interesting passage, we're talking about Lot, he's called Just Lot, and if you ever read his uh, story in the Bible, I don't think many people would call him Just Lot, just as a title, that he's just. So Just Lot, he's called a righteous man here, and it says that he is vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. So if you know anything about his story, where is he living at this time that we're talking about here? Sodom and Gomorrah place that we know that God destroyed because of their great wickedness in order to be an example to those who would come after who would wish to live ungodly lives. So Lot here, it says he's vexed with a filthy conversation. That word conversation, it's taken a lot of change over the years, but in the context of this passage, what we're talking about is his behavior, conduct, or way of life. Okay? So it's not exactly what he's saying, although that has to do with it, it's talking about his behavior or the way that he lives his life, the things that he does. So it's basically every aspect of, of life is conversation, okay? And we live in a world where our conversation, our lives, the way that we act, the way that we compose ourselves, our behavior is being compromised or being tried to be compromised on a daily basis. We come under these attacks all the time. So just like Lot, we live in a filthy, sinful world. And there's no getting around that until God comes and, and uh, takes care of the sin and throws the devil in hell and all that stuff. We're, we're stuck here, right? Until we die and go to heaven or God comes back for us, we're stuck here. And so we have to deal with it. But that's no excuse to be blind to it. So we live in a sinful world just like Lot. And we too are vexed with the filthy conversation or lifestyle of the wicked. And tonight... I'm primarily going to concentrate on um, these cell phones. Devices is what I'm going to call them tonight. So let me, let me define some terms for you. This right here is a device. I'm using it to preach off of. So devices can be used for some good things, right? Phones, we can use them to text. We can use them to call. We can use them to get on Facebook or Instagram or something like that. Your TV is a device. Your computer is a device. Anything that you use to connect with other people is considered a device. So we're going to be talking primarily tonight about devices in our lives as well as social media and how we as Christians should conduct ourselves in a world that whether we like it or not is completely entrenched 
in these two things, social media and devices. Because technology is moving forward, and in case you haven't noticed, it's, it's moving forward with everybody. You almost can't do anything without technology today. You can barely buy things without technology today. So the world is getting more and more bonded with this technology, with these devices, and our conversation is becoming more and more an online thing, something that the whole world has access to through things like Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or YouTube or things like that. You guys may not know it, but there's probably a lot of teenagers in our very church who have a YouTube channel. In fact, I've seen some of them. So kids who have YouTube channels that tell, you, tell everybody who's watching what their daily lives are like, and they're kind of putting themselves out there. The same thing on Facebook or Instagram or different things like that. We're constantly putting ourselves out there. Now, I know some of you guys are thinking right now, you know, I don't even have a Facebook, things like that. Look, I don't have a Facebook, okay? My wife has a Facebook with my name on it, but I don't ever use it. I have the church Instagram, but I don't ever use it. Um, and I, I'm over the social media here, so I have a lot of um, responsibilities that, that take place within that realm. But even though I don't have those things, I'm still affected by them. Okay? Just today, my sister sent me something, and she said, hey, look at this post. You have to read this. And I read it, and I thought, man, I wish that hadn't been posted for the whole world to see. And... We live in a world now where these devices and these social medias, they are completely intertwined with our lives, whether it's with our children's lives, whether it's with our husbands, wives' lives, with our friends, our family, it connects us. But these, these great tools can also be a great avenue of evil, okay? So I'm going to primarily be concentrating on social media and devices. Just remember, anytime I'm talking about devices, I'm talking about just some sort of technology that connects you to someone, whether it's a TV or a computer or a cell phone, it doesn't matter. So the vast majority of us have these devices and also have social media accounts, but we've never been taught how we're supposed to use them. And that's something that kind of the whole world has been trying to learn together. If you've been following the news at all lately, um, you know that Mark Zuckerberg was brought before um, a grand jury and said they basically said, what are, you, what are you doing? What have you been doing for all these years? You're selling people's information, and now people's stuff has been hacked, and man, all this stuff is going on. Well, there was no laws. There's nothing stopping. And so we're all, as a world, trying to learn together how to conduct ourselves in a world that's becoming progressively more technological. And so as Christians, we especially have to learn to navigate these dangerous waters. And so I think some principles from the Bible tonight will really help us. And we're going to be focusing on that word conversation because our conversation is no longer just how we act at work or how we act in the home. It's also how we act on the internet. It's also how we act whenever we're watching TV. It's also how we act whenever we're on the computer. And all these different things that we're doing, it's now part of our conversation, whether we like it or not. So... Quickly, let me give you some of the consequences of using social media and devices improperly. Okay, this is just, I went online, and as I was doing research for this, I just searched what, what are some things in our society that's happening because of our addiction to social media and devices and things like that. Let me give you the kind of list of some of the stuff that I found. So, you have angry, judgmental spirits being produced. You have pride, hugely, hugely pride happening because people are so focused on themselves. You have envy and discontent. Man, that's a huge one to be dealing with if you're looking at pictures of what stuff that you want or you're constantly browsing Amazon to buy and purchase and put things in your cart or um, wasting time. Man, how many of you guys have struggled with that on your cell phone? Wasting time. I know. That's a hard one. Obsessing over news and current events. How many of you guys just constantly refreshing that news page anytime you get a spare second? That's a hard one. Multitasking to the point of being unproductive. Man, that's sad. We have these devices that are designed to make our lives more productive, make our jobs easier, and we're multitasking so much that we actually find ourselves becoming unproductive because we're trying to do too much. We're leaving responsibilities unfinished or forgotten. We have shorter attention spans, as you know, I'm finding out tonight. <laughs> As you guys are probably finding out with your children, big time, um, 
just on that really quickly, I was watching a show the other day, um, a, a guy, a show about building trucks. And I was noticing, because I've been doing a lot more video editing and stuff for the church, I was noticing all the jump cuts they were doing. And like every three seconds, just next time you watch TV, watch how many times they change the picture that's on the TV. Whether it's just a truck, they're, they're working on the engine, right? They have 15 different angles of what they're doing on that, and they're changing constantly. Why? To keep your attention. They've mastered this idea of you constantly have to see something new, see something new, see something new. And that's what Facebook does. You're scrolling endlessly on Facebook. Or you're scrolling endlessly on whatever device you're using. Why? Because you're trying to constantly feed that machine that's producing that dopamine in your body. It's, it's making us have shorter attention spans. We have an incessant need to be entertained. Man, that's something that I'm really struggling with downstairs um, teaching the kids is trying to find ways to entertain them because at home they have video games and they have computers and they have TV and all this stuff. And now it's so hard to get people's attention for stuff that actually really matters. So the incessant need to be entertained. We're careless with our words. It's so much easier to say something careless online whenever you're behind the screen of a computer or the screen of a phone than it would be to say something in real life. So we're careless with our words. We're distracted. Um, we're addicted to ourselves, selfies and, and looking at how many posts or how many likes we get and things like that. We have a clouded perception of reality. Man, I was watching a video the other day of um, some people had layered a bunch of local news stations where all the local news stations were saying the exact same thing from news stations all over the country. They layered them all together, and what they were saying was so... Um, similar that you could hear what they were all saying, even though there was about 50 of them all saying it at the same time. So our perception of reality, the perception that we're being fed through the news and through social media, through our devices, things like that, it's not reality. That reality doesn't exist. It's what something somebody's trying to give to you. Somebody's trying to distort. So we have a clouded perception of reality. We're blind to true beauty. These advertising companies that try and make uh, women and men look uh, unnaturally beautiful and we think that we have to attain to that that's not true so we have a clouded perception of reality we have a blindness to true beauty we have a huge problem with boredom we constantly have to be doing something with boredom we have addictions addictions are going through the roof right now because we have access to so many different things we have a fear of silence and a fear of solitude every single second we have to be on our phone every spare moment we get we have to be doing something looking at something listening to something, hearing something. Think about the drive to work in the morning in your car. The radio has to be on, right? So we have a fear of solitude. We have a heightened insecurity. We have heightened insecurities. We're, we're, so, we're so encapsulated by looking at all these things out there in the world that we're starting to feel insecure about ourselves that maybe we're not good enough. So just to name a few, these using social media, using these devices improperly, it generates a lot of problems. And if you're thinking, well, that, that's not something that I really struggle with, guess what? Your kids do. Kids do, hugely. Your friends do. Your family does. It's a big problem. So how do I know if I'm using my devices improperly? This is just a couple of questions I'm going to ask. And just there in your seat, just think about these questions and answer them to yourself. Number one, is my device making it difficult for me to connect with others and provide them with my full attention? Do I habitually use my device as a means of escape, from dis or, uh, escape and distraction from boredom and engagement with others? If you're walking down the street or you're, you see someone you know and you don't want to talk to them, so you pull up your phone really quick and act like you're doing something else. I see people giggling. So that's one people struggle with. Is my device taking up time that would have otherwise been given to prayer, quiet, Bible reading, thinking? Do I use my device as a means of distraction from unsettling truths and realities present in my life? Am I living in a social media sphere where my judgment, opinions, and personality are being shaped by entities other than God and his word? Is my device taking up so much time that I am often unproductive, distracted, and unaware of the life events that are happening around me? Is my device a tool to be used or a precious idol that I could never give up? 
Is my device preventing me from developing deep personal relationships with my spouse, children, and friends? Am I using my device as a means to glorify God, edify others, and grow in the knowledge of the truth? See, we have this wonderful tool, these wonderful tools at our disposal, but oftentimes we get caught in these ruts. We get caught in these sins. We get caught in these, these dangerous places. So chances are that everyone in this room struggles with this in some way. Think about it. It's done something to our conversation. It's done something to our lifestyle. Nobody is unaffected by this. And because of that, we have to learn, we have to now teach ourselves how to conduct ourselves in this world that we, whether, whether or not we like it, we live in it. Okay? So Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, it says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So our conversation, our lifestyle, is supposed to be a representation of the gospel. So if I were to go to your Facebook page today and just look, does it represent the gospel? If I went to your Instagram page, does it represent, does it represent the gospel of Jesus Christ or does it represent Stephen Burton? Is it hundreds of these? Or hundreds of taking pictures of your food or something like that. Oftentimes, our social media, it's a, my wife said, social media, right? Social me, it's all about me, right? So we're supposed to let our conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. And oftentimes, in our social media, for some reason, in every area of life, we try to, we try to present the gospel to others through our lifestyle. But oftentimes, social media is the one place where God's not allowed. God's off limits, right? And sometimes we'll post a verse here and there, but a lot of times with some, some people, you're actually doing more damage because everything else surrounding those verses is all about you and all about problems and all about things that uh, wouldn't be uh, becoming to the gospel. So some of the primary causes of this decay in our lifestyle, this decay in our conversation are these. Social media offers a huge array of false realities. And we talked about that just a little bit. But the internet personalities that uh, we follow, that we invest our time in, that we, that we look at, or um, different things like that, these Hollywood stars or movie actors or anything like that, they're, they're all portraying a life that doesn't actually exist. Okay? You're seeing what they want you to see. Okay? And you do the same thing. You ever take a picture of maybe your wife and she's, oh, don't put that on anything. I don't want people to see me like that. Here, take another one. Or maybe you took a candid photo of some of your family members and, no, I, I don't like that one. My hair's messed up. I, I don't know what it is, but we're always trying to portray this kind of perfect life to everybody on social media, right? Well, it's the same thing with everybody. And so these realities that we're seeing, they're not real. They're not true. And because of that, what we're trying to attain to isn't possible a lot of times. So we, we invest time in these people, but they're not real. They're, they're, they're offering a false reality, okay? So then we also become obsessed. We have become obsessed with, and we conform to what we spend our time looking at. So you ever get kind of like into some hobby, and you can't stop trying to learn about it and look at it and read about it and all these things? I get like that all the time. Where I'm trying to, I, I find some new thing that I attach on to, and I just spend hours looking things up and facts and figures and all this stuff. Well, we become obsessed with those things that we're constantly placing our thoughts on, those things that we're constantly looking at. And so if we're scrolling endlessly on Facebook or Instagram or something like that, that's taking up time, valuable time in our lives that we put towards something that actually matters. So God has a purpose for your devices, God has a purpose. For your social media accounts. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6.20. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit which are God's. So our purpose after we're saved is to glorify God. And so God's purpose for our devices. Even though we never see any references to cell phones in the Bible. The principles are still there. Right? And so whenever we look at what God wants our, our devices to be like. What our social media to be like. He wants it to be something that glorifies him. 
So God wants us to glorify him with our lives. And a large part of what others see about our life takes place on social media and on our devices. So does, does my actions, do my actions on social media and on my devices glorify God? And a lot of times, I'm not even talking about maybe what you post at on social media, maybe what you're looking at online. Maybe what sort of web searches that you do, what kind of TV shows you watch. Those sort of things, they need to be glorifying towards God rather than bringing him shame. So God has a purpose for your device, but also Satan has a purpose for your device. Now, it's completely different from God's purpose, but 1 Peter 5 eight, you guys probably know it, says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And let me tell you this. Satan is so glad that they invented cell phones. So glad they invented all these devices. So glad they invited, invented uh, social media. Why? Because it's a great, powerful thing that can be used for evil. It's a powerful thing that can be used for evil. So Satan is looking for any means that he can to destroy you. And our devices allow us to have access to a whole world full of evil. And if Satan can get us to tap into it, he will. And so whatever it is, Satan has a purpose for it. And so we have to decide, are we using it for God's purpose or for Satan's purpose? But also your flesh has a purpose for your device. We can choose to ignore Satan's purpose. We can choose to ignore God's purpose. But we have to choose one of them. And a lot of times it's our flesh's purpose for our devices. And for some reason, I think because um, maybe it's so new, we think that these things with cell phones, these things with uh, you know, iPads and computers and stuff, it kind of exists outside of the realm of what I use it for God, what I use it for Satan. It's kind of like my own personal little thing that God doesn't know about. But the Bible says in 1 John 2.16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. So your flesh wants to bring itself pleasure. Now, as I was doing some research for this um, for this message, I was reading an article. They actually did a study uh, in 2014 about the effects of Facebook on your brain. And they compared and contrasted between somebody who was using cocaine on a regular basis and somebody who was just using Facebook, just using it all the time. They were addicted to it. And the correlation was actually really, really strong. In fact, it was actually stronger. The brain's addiction was actually stronger in those who used Facebook than it was even in those who used cocaine. So it says, a study published in the Journal of Psychological Reports uh, for Disability and Trauma discovered that compulsive Facebook users show greater activity in the activation of the amygdala and stratum, the systems of the brain involved in impulsive behavior, and also the part of the brain that we see more activity in uh, for drug addicts. But interestingly, Unlike the brains of cocaine addicts, the region of the brain that inhibits this behavior are functioning just fine. In other words, even though people are fully capable of cutting back on their Facebook use and their activity online, they refuse to do so. So those inhibitors that are in place that God placed in your brain to say, hey, that's enough, they still fully function whenever you're using social media and stuff like that. But we just choose not to use them. We just choose not to activate them. The cocaine act, they, they're going to have a hard time stopping. But studies have actually shown that you can stop Facebook whenever you want. I mean, it's a little bit hard. They make it really hard to delete it, I know. They actually reactivate it if you try and delete it. But there are ways to take care of that. And studies show we actually can stop it. We can stop that addiction just like that. But it has to be a choice. So the lust of the eyes wants us to look at inappropriate things online, such as pornography or the accounts of attractive coworkers. And that's, that's cheating just as much as pornography is. Um, the pride of life wants you to post a new selfie every single day and then obsess over how many likes you get on it from people that you don't even care about. If you're a parent or you plan on becoming a parent, or even if you don't plan on becoming a parent, your children live in a world where hashtags are something as simple as tying your shoe. Okay, the other day I was up here explaining um, to the church what a hashtag is. And probably some people didn't know what it was, some people did. Well, your kids are growing up in a society, I grew up in a society where that's just second nature. Everybody knows what that means. Everyone knows how to do it. Selfies are commonplace. If you look at the, the uh, accounts of 
your teenage girls, your teenage boys, it's very self-centered a lot of times. Getting to know someone on social media means stalking them on Facebook or looking at all their pictures on Instagram or texting them constantly. Interacting pe with people means posting a picture and seeing how many likes it gets. Calling someone on the phone is scary, okay? Calling and making your own appointments is scary because you've never had to do it before, I guess. Um, where life-altering decisions could be made with the press of a button. Think about that. Some boy pressures your little girl into taking pictures of herself, and she can ruin her life with the press of a button. Just like that, it goes all over the whole world. Your young man decides that he likes some girl, and he's going to try and show off, takes a picture of himself, sends it to some girl. It goes everywhere, just like that. I mean, they can, they can ruin their reputation just, just like that. And in fact, anyone in this room can, just like that. Get themselves in trouble, just like that. It's scary. It's scary. And if it doesn't have your attention, it needs to. Life-altering decisions can be made with just a push of a button. Where the line between offline life and online life literally does not exist. In your kids' lives, the line between social media life, online life, and reality, that line does not exist. They are exactly the same. They are one and the same. And in fact, more of your kids' life probably takes place online than it does in real life. We're like drones that have just spent time scrolling through our phones, right? And that's where our society is going. Even if it's not there yet with some of the older generation, it is there with the younger generation. Ask Brother Rod. He'll tell you all about how hard it is. Whenever he walks into the, the youth building, instead of people talking, it's this. It's scary. Because guess what? If we as Christians, if we as parents don't set an example how to properly use these type of things, who's going to learn? Who's going to learn? So how do we escape from the overwhelming amount of evil that these devices can cause? How do we use these things properly? Well, let me give you some principles. So really, I just tried to come up with just the most practical stuff that I could um, for using social media and devices correctly. Okay? So the first one is to strive to connect with others, not just to get attention from others. Strive to connect with others, not just to get attention from others. Oftentimes, what social media and devices and stuff like that, that does, it's a means of all about me. Everything's about me. Look at me. Like me. Be my friend, right? But if we actually seek to use those means to connect with people, you know, maybe a long-lost relative that you haven't called on the phone forever, but it's really easy to send a Facebook message to. Think about how easy... Social media has made it for us to connect with people out there. And oftentimes, rather than connecting with people, we shut ourselves out from people. We get blocked on Instagram because we post too many selfies. Right? That's hard. So we need to strive to connect with others, not just to get attention from others. Next, we need to protect ourselves and our information. Look, if, if you're saving your passwords and your usernames and your bank account information and things like that on your computer... Go home and get rid of that, like as soon as possible. It's not safe. It's not safe saved on your computer. If you think your computer software is going to protect you from hackers who are highly skilled at getting in there and stealing your bank information, you're, you're dead wrong. It's not going to protect you. So if you're saving things like passwords and documents and things like that on your computer that you want to keep private, your computer, your phone is not the place for that because they're not safe. Just just a couple of weeks ago, like I was telling you with the Facebook thing, 50 million, they, they, they've estimated 50 million users whose information was stolen by hacker groups. And that's including bank information, all sorts of stuff like that. It's scary. So protect your information. Don't, look, put yourself out there. It's okay to put yourself out there and post pictures and, and connect with people and stuff like that. But personal information is not, is not Facebook's information. It's not Facebook's business, okay? And if people are true, truly your friends and you trust them with that information, then give it to them, okay? But it's not, it's not, it doesn't belong on your computer. It doesn't belong on your phone, okay? That's not safe. Ask yourself, would I say this to someone's face? This is a big one. Over text, we say a lot of things that we would never say in person, okay? It's way easier to be mean over text than, than in person. It's way easier over Facebook Messenger to say something that we really shouldn't have. So the question is, would I say this to somebody if they were standing right there in front of me? And if you wouldn't, 
Don't say it. Okay? And maybe you're saying, I don't have a, I don't have a censor. I can say whatever I want. You know? Okay, well, then just filter it through the Bible first. <laughs> all right? And that's what all of us should do in the beginning. Filter it through the Bible. Should I be saying this? Then, after that, would I say this to somebody's face? No? Okay, don't say it. Next, don't get caught up in drama and in arguments. You're thinking, no, I don't have anything to do with drama. But you see that post on there about, you know, guns are wrong versus guns are right. And you kind of start reading the comments and you're getting angry and you think, I'm just going to post on this, right? A lot of times we get caught up in those dramas. A lot of times we get caught up in what the news is saying and we get caught up in all these, all these things that really in the end don't matter. You don't have to get caught up in them. You don't have to post. You don't have to say anything. It's okay. So don't get caught up in drama. Don't get caught up in arguments, especially not online. Okay, my sisters, I told you they, they uh, sent me something today. They said, hey, read this. What do you think we should do about it? I said, don't do anything about it, okay? Don't post back. Don't call. Don't say anything. It, it, don't give them the satisfaction, all right? Because your dirty laundry does not, this should not be aired for the whole world to see on social media. All right? It's not the place for it. Okay? So try not to get caught up in the drama. Try not to get caught up in the arguments. This is a big one. Have a purpose for using your device. Don't just use it to kill time. Okay? This is something that I struggle with. Purposefully taking my phone out of my pocket. What am I going to do with it now that it's in my hand? Am I just checking these things? Am I checking Facebook? Am I checking Instagram just to kill time? Hey, how about put the phone away and go talk to somebody? I know it can be hard, but we can do it. Maybe whenever you get home, the first thing you want to do is sit down in front of the TV and just watch your show. But your kids haven't seen you all day. Go talk to them. And guess what? They're in their room playing video games and on their phone too. I know. Go take it away from them. You're a parent. It's all right. <laughs> My kids aren't going to like me very much. So have a purpose when you use your device. Don't just use it to kill time. Next, don't be mean. Remember that you are a witness for Christ. A lot of times, it's just like what I was saying. We'll say things over text and email and letters and all this stuff that we would never say in person. Don't be mean. Just remember that you're a witness for Christ. Next, strive for balance. Strive for balance in your life. There's nothing wrong with using social media. There's nothing wrong with watching TV, being on the computer, playing games, whatever you want to do. But just have balance where you place your time. Just like everything else in life. Have balance. Next, be productive. Be productive whenever you get on social media. Be productive whenever you get on your cell phone and things like that. There's, there's a huge wealth of information out there that we can use to better ourselves, to learn things. Don't just get on there to kill time, like I said. Get on there to actually learn something, to actually grow in some way. And one of the things that our church social media accounts have really strove to do is provide people with something to do. Whenever they are using social media, something to share with their friends, something to talk about. One of, one of my greatest burdens whenever we started uh, the, the daily devotional series, and me and Pastor had talked about this for a while, was just to give people something to do every morning. We post them at 7 a.m. I have to post those by hand, right? I wake up and post those by hand. So they're posted there for you so that whenever you wake up in the morning, a lot of people, the first thing they do is they turn their alarm off or they get on their phone or something like that. And right there, on three different places, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, you can watch a, a quick one-minute devotional from our pastor. Something that's going to be biblical, something that's going to encourage you, something that's going to help you through your day, and get your, get your day started in the right way. Maybe say, you know what, I don't have time to get up in the morning, I don't have time to read my Bible and things like that. Well, guess what? Everybody has time to watch a 45-second to one-minute devotional. Okay? So we've tried to give you... Resources, we try to use our social media accounts to reach out into the community. Um, I say pr be productive whenever you're sharing things online. If you read something good that, that would be um, encouraging to someone or something like that, go ahead and send it. Go ahead and learn how to use these things to be productive, to, to encourage others, to be a witness for others. There's nothing wrong with liking a post or sharing a post with a friend that maybe you, you know would, would like to see something like that. That's a great thing to do. Next is limit your time. And this is something that me and Michelle do have done a couple of times that we should probably do more often. This is, um, I don't think, I don't know where I picked this up from, but I, I liked it. You just say, tonight we're not going to have any cell phones or any computers or any TV or anything. We're just going to spend time together. 
and we'll go and pick up a puzzle, and we'll have a night where as soon as I get home from work, phones go away. Nothing else is out. We're just going to spend time together whether we like it or not, right? And we, as families, need to do more of that. Because oftentimes, our, our time together, maybe we're at the dinner table, maybe we're playing a game together or something, but there's this constant, oh, my turn. You're not there. If you're here, you're not there. Okay? And so we, as families, we need to have time where we limit those, the accessibility to those things. Video games for kids, TV for ourselves, phones, iPads, all these things. Just have a night, literally, where you just put them away and spend time together. Maybe for you, it's a, a time period where you say from, you know, 7 Seven to bedtime each night, we're just not going to have the devices out anymore. I'm giving you guys stuff your kids are going to hate this. I love it. Because <laughs> I would have hated it too. So, but there has to be that time because we're conditioning our kids, we're conditioning our friends and family to not care about whether or not we're actually engaging with each other and actually developing those really um, intimate relationships, especially with our children. So don't let them become more in tune with what's happening on social media than what's happening in their own lives with their families, okay? Build those strong bonds. And the only way that you're going to do that, unfortunately, is just by limiting the time and saying, look, on this day, no phones. On this, from this time to this time, no, no cell phones, no computer, no TV, no nothing. We're going to spend time together. Just do it. Like, that's something that you can do tonight, even. That's something that you can say, all right, this week we're going to try this. So if you, if you take one thing away, at least try that. Next, protect yourself and your family with accountability. I just want to park here just for a second because accountability is, is a safety function that people are starting to realize is super important on devices. Whenever these cell phones and things like that came out, there was no accountability. That's what people loved about it so much. You could do whatever you want, say whatever you want, look at whatever you want, no one would ever know about it. It's all secretive. But accountability takes those things that are all secretive and gripping our hearts, gripping our lives, and brings it out into the light. And that's a good thing. You would never leave loaded guns with the safety off just laying around your house. Some on the couch, some on the cabinet, some in the kitchen, some on the floor. Whoever picks one up, just let them do whatever they want with it. That's insane. We would never do that. You would never get your teenager, hey, you just turned 13, let me give you your first rifle. Do whatever you want with it. Have fun. But if you misuse it, I'll take it away. By the time they misuse it, it's too late. It's the same thing with these cell phones. It's the same thing with these devices. If you're not putting safeties on them, if you're not putting accountability on them, then it's just as deadly as a firearm, a kid walking around with a firearm, just blind firing wherever they want. You can't do that. And So find ways to put safeties on there. What I use very simply is a, an app. You can install it on your iPad. You can install it on your cell phone, on your computer, on your tablets, anything. It works for anything. It's called Accountable to You. And every single day, it sends my wife a report of literally everything that I did on all of my devices every single day. That's scary, right? That's scary for a lot of people in this room. It was scary for me too, but you know, I, I want her to know that I'm accountable to her. And so... If I click on something that, that the app deems inappropriate, it sends her a text and an email. If I make changes to the settings of the app, it sends her an email and a text. It gives her a red flag. Look, there's nothing I can do on any of my devices, even if I wanted to, without her knowing about it. And guess what? Total safety, total protection. Just like that. And she can even go in and see what, where I clicked on the phone what buttons I pressed, what things I typed. It's amazing. And everybody in this whole room should have something like that on their phones. I understand if you have a work phone or something like that and you can't do that. But take, there's, there's, take the effort, take the time to put the effort into protecting yourself. And especially your kids. Especially your kids. If you're sitting in this room right now and you have a kid who has a cell phone that's completely unprotected, you're playing with fire. Go home tonight, look up Accountable to You. You have to pay a monthly subscription, but it's worth it. It's six bucks. But it's worth it. Put it on everyone's devices. 
okay? It works great, and it will just take those things that used to be easily accessible in the dark and bring them out into the light. It's a simple, it's a simple fix to something that seems really, really scary, okay? Turn over to 1 Peter chapter 1. You're already pretty close, I would imagine. 1 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to be in verse 15. I just want to leave you with this. Verse 15. The Bible says, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. In all manner of conversation, we're to be holy. That's not a suggestion. That's a commandment. That's a commandment. And these deadly devices... These things that can so easily corrupt our conversation, our lifestyles, they need to be holy, just like any other area of your life is. Don't, don't make this departure where this is something for you, that God and Satan and spirituality have nothing to do with. This is my area. Sure, preach on you know, faith and hope and love and all this stuff, but don't, don't take away my device. Don't take away my TV. Look, every area of our life needs to be holy. It's commanded in the Bible. Read that one more time and I'll be done. But as he which had called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this time that you've given us. Uh, just to look over some of these things that I really think uh, are important. And things that I think you put on my heart to say tonight. And God, I just pray that. You would take some of the principles, some of the things that we talked about tonight, and just help us as Christians to employ them in our own lives. And even though we're a lot of times really entrenched in our habits, and it can be so much easier to just not build any momentum, not make any change, God, I pray that you would give each and every person in this room the courage to make that leap. Say, you know what? We're going to bond together as a family. We're going to be stronger as, as a couple. I'm going to get to know my kids better regardless of whether or not I have to use my phone less or watch less TV. God, I just pray that you would give us the strength, the courage, the knowledge, the wisdom, and the faith to be exactly what you want us to be. And Lord, you've commanded us to be holy. You know that we in and of ourselves don't have the ability to be holy. And God, I pray that you would help each and every saved person in this room to just allow your spirit to work in their heart and life and show exactly what you want us to do. On a day-to-day -day basis, Lord, I pray that you would just help us to know exactly how we're supposed to conduct ourselves in this changing world that sometimes can be so scary and hard to live in and hard to understand, God. But I pray that you would give us access to the wisdom, the people that can help us, and Lord, that we would do what's right for our family, for our friends, and for ourselves, Lord. God, I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If the pianist